Hey, it's Lurk from Lamb Goat. Thanks for checking out this episode of the podcast. Make sure you go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube channel and you hit that notification bell so you're notified when we release new episodes. Drop us a like on this video, and if you don't mind, give us a comment on what you thought of the video or who we should have on the podcast. Make sure you follow us and our guest on social media. All those links are in the description below. Also, I want to go ahead and say thank you and shout out all of our Patreon supporters for this month, JC, Alec, Jeff, Lachlan, and Dylan. Thank you for supporting the podcast. We very much appreciate it. Not only do our Patreon supporters get early access to all of our episodes, but you get a little bit of swag from Lamgo and the Van Flip. This month, we're giving away Internal Incarceration by Year of the Knife on vinyl. So if you're a Patreon supporter, you're automatically entered to win this, and we will hold the contest at the end of the month. So go ahead and join if you're not a Patreon supporter, and we look forward to seeing you there. Hey, Van Flip fam. Big goof on my part. For some reason, the video did not record or save when we were doing our interview with Diamond. So unfortunately, there is no video. However, I'll put up a cool screenshot of us as we were talking that I took after I found out that it wasn't recording video. So big goof on my part. We're happy to be back. There's a lot coming for the Van Flip. There's a lot in store, a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes. So we are happy to be back and I'm happy to be here. So for now, enjoy Diamond from Tatriarch. Welcome back to the podcast. Um, today's guest is Diamond Rowe. Uh, she recently was touted by, was it the singer of Disturbed? I, you know, I don't know. It was just from their uh, their band page. It was, it was just really weird, you know. I, like, was on our band page, and I see, like, Disturbed has tagged you in something. And I was like, what? Like, what did Disturbed tag me in, you know? So it was weird. I don't know who it was, but, yeah. <laughs> they were like, uh, it was about your guitar skills. It was, like, one of the, one, one of the people to look out for, or? It was the, uh, I did, a like, a, a list with Metal Hammer, and it was, like, your top 10 new metal influences and I put Dan on there. So that's what they, they posted, which is interesting because I wouldn't even think they would have saw it, but yeah, that's what they, they, uh, they reposted. So. Well, that's cool. That's cool. Well, going back to your band and who you are, you were diamond row. You were the, uh, the lead guitar player of Tetrarch. Is it, te- is it pronounced Tetrarch? Tetrarch? Tetrarch. So it's kind of like if it, the CH was a K Tetrarch. Okay. Okay. But you said it so much better than most, so <laughs> good job. <laughs> I, I tried to, yeah, I tried to pronounce it beforehand. I tried, I looked it up and everything because uh, yeah, yeah, it it is also like a Roman Empire type of situation, and I found the meaning of it interesting. It's one of four rulers, and you guys have four people in the band, and I was wondering if that kind of played a part in the naming of the band. Yeah, so it's like I tell people all the time, me and Josh, we met the singer guitar rhythm guitar player in our band. We met in middle school, like in when we were like eleven or twelve. So when we we kind of started some form of tetrarch in like when we were fourteen. So it was like we were in history class or something. You know, you're looking. We went through all these names, like when it didn't even matter, but like we went through all these names and we're in history class and they said something about a tetrarch and we're like, that kind of works. So it just kind of stuck and it is like a kingdom ruled by four people. So we were like, oh, there's four of us in the band, so that'd be cool. And here we are. So <laughs> Yeah, you guys are getting a lot of like notoriety and a lot of, you know, people talking about you lately. Um mm-hmm. but you guys technically started in like two thousand seven, correct? Like Yeah. Is that when yeah. you met Josh in is that in seventh grade or did you start making music around that time too, or was that at a later point? So I met Josh in twenty in two thousand 12 or 2002 excuse me 12 2002 but we like kind of started jamming together closer to high school um and we didn't play our first show as tetrarch like at a local venue until 2007 so it was like me and josh and then two others that you know obviously aren't in the band now but it's like our first show and at that (laughs) what's funny is at that time a lot of people were like look at us as like some sort of new metal band now or something but back then we were like straight up a thrash metal band like (laughs) Like, like completely mega death, like, you know, fast, thrashy riffs. So it was a form of Tetrarch at the time. I and mean, we always say 2007 because that's kind of just when we were like, okay, let's start playing shows and, you know, do the real band stuff. Did you guys really play 100 shows that year? Probably because, honestly, we were, you know, at that point when you're just learning how to play shows and, and stuff, you're not like – thinking about draw or anything you're just trying to like get better at playing shows like you just enjoy it so we would play a show friday saturday sunday 
every weekend, like when we weren't in school. And then when we were in school, we would just play whenever. So it was like, and sometimes we'd play the same. There was a venue called Insomnia by our bar, like, you know, kind of out in the boonies of Georgia. But they would let us play like back to back days just because it was like this little small place. So we would play there all the time. So absolutely probably played about 100 shows that year, just learning how to play shows. There might not have been anybody there, but, you know. <laughs> getting the feel for things. Getting, they, get, yeah, so, some of them could have been more like a practice, but. <laughs> and you guys are from Atlanta or around Atlanta? Cuz you're playing from... you're playing some shows in Douglasville when you started, correct? Yeah, exactly. So we're from we were all born in Atlanta. Well, me and Josh uh we're from Atlanta, but we lived like kind of a little bit on the outskirts, like 20 minutes like in the suburbs, you know. That's cool. Um Yeah. So when did you guys like you guys started recording it sounds like or from the internet because there's not that much about you guys on the internet just yet even though you guys have been like a band for some time so it was interesting to yeah. try to dig up info but um you guys self-released an ep relentless in 2013 um did you guys record any of that thrashy metal stuff in the early days or is that we all did like, we hey, did you... we had we have a we had an ep before that actually two eps before that one called pravda which was really thrashy and then one called the will to fight um, which the will to fight used to be on like our Spotify and our iTunes. So we took it down <laughs> recently because it was, it's just like so far from removed from what we are now. Um, but it's like a super thrashy. It, I mean, there's some sick stuff on there. We listen back and we're like, man, we were killing it. But um, <laughs> yeah, we did have a couple before relentless relentless. We kind of had a little like metal core turn of events for a bit. That's kind of where we started shifting. Um, but the one before the, the two before that were definitely thrashy. I don't know how people, they might be on YouTube, honestly. I think some of it is on YouTube, but other than that, I don't know how, how people can find it. So how did you get into playing guitar in general? Um, Yeah, so I, I tell people all the time, like for me, I was always one of those kids where it was like, when I got into something, I didn't want to sit on the sidelines and, and I wanted to be a part of it always. So when I started getting into heavier music or like into rock at the time, I think I, like I started with nirvana and then it, like system of a down and progressively got heavier i instantly just wanted to like play guitar and be in a band so i told my my parents i was like oh i want to play guitar my mom was like my mom was so stoked actually that like i was getting into something she's like oh this is great <laughs> um she she went out and got me a guitar uh probably that week and i started lessons like on my 13th birthday or 12th birthday i started guitar lessons so um that's basically it. And I didn't put it down. Like I took it to the bathroom. I took it to the dinner table. I took it in the car. Like I never put it down. And they were so surprised because, you know, they hope it's not like a phase or something that I'm just, you know, I put down um, quick and it, it wasn't. I stuck with it like crazy. My brother used to be like, this is just a phase, like, you know, but it, it didn't end up being one. So um, <laughs> <laughs> that's definitely how, how I did it. It was really natural. And it's weird because people say to me all the time, they're like, there was no nothing big that like made you want to play guitar. And I literally just remember being in the car and being like, I think I want to play guitar. Yeah. Like it just popping into my head like that. I don't, I don't really know. So you were, have you grown up on a steady diet of like grunge metal and new metal influences or like, how did you stumble into that as well? Um, I actually didn't. I, you know, I was into your typical like in sync and, you know, <laughs> hip hop and like, puff daddy back in the at the time and all that kind of stuff um and then i had a friend in school she was a little older than me she was actually my brother's age but you know you like kind of look up to somebody and like you think they're yeah. cool yeah and she was into like pearl jam and nirvana and like a lot of bands like that so she was always talking about like kurt cobain kurt cobain kurt cobain and i was like oh, i gotta go look up who this dude is because she's <laughs> always talking about him she's obsessed with this guy and i went out and i bought like the Nirvana MTV Unplugged, like it's a great uh, acoustic album. album. Yeah, it's really good. And I remember listening to Lake of Fire. I think that was the first song I like the cover they did I ever heard. Um, and I was like, oh, they're not that bad, you know, which was like the perfect start because it was soft. It wasn't right. anything like crazy. Um, and then I think that same time I bought that album, I was like, I'm just going to buy another rock album. And I saw Toxicity. So I bought that at the same time just because it was there and it looked cool. Um, and those are the two I started with. And you know, I I started with that and then I I was listening to the radio, you know, like at the time it was like a lot of Linkin Park and Disturbed and all that kind right, of stuff right. on the radio. So I kind of gradually got into it, but I definitely wasn't into it to start. You know, it was it was it was something I, I sought out. 
that's cool. Yeah, a lot. Of, I mean, yeah. a lot of people that seem to listen to heavier music, they don't naturally click with it right away. In general, it's you know you got to kind of grow into it. Kind of like beer, you know, it's an acquired taste, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, it definitely is, and it. But it really matched my personality. Like I'm super like. You know, like I'm very like my personality is very aggressive and stuff like that. So it definitely was like fitting for me. And I, and I loved it. And I was always like I was always so like unique, like for like my demographic of a person, you know, like <laughs> I'm a black girl, but I like loved motocross and like fishing. And like, you know, I was my big thing before music was softball. Like I was an avid softball player. So like I was always into weird stuff. Um, So, so it was only natural that. I went to, to metal. Like, you know, my parents weren't surprised at all. They're like, oh, yeah, <laughs> that seems about right. <laughs> we saw it coming a mile away. Oh, yeah, for sure. So your parents don't listen to the similar styles or? Um, so my my dad's actually been in the music business for 40 years. So he he is a like a, a arena tour promoter. So he did, but he always did. Like, he worked with like Michael Jackson, like R. Kelly and and Prince and a lot of like that genre. Um. But so no, he he knew nothing about metal at the time except for Metallica because he had to, he was booking tours and routing around Metallica's tour all the time because they yeah. were doing you know, two days in an arena and all that kind of stuff. Um, but you know, and my mom, she is a little more open minded with music. She's totally a metalhead now. Like her <laughs> favorite metal bands, Gojira, and she loves them. Nice. And like she, you know, when I play something not super heavy, she's like, eh, you know. Um, but I, I kind of taught them about metal, you know, in, in hard rock. Yeah. And and they're, you know, but they've come a long way. My mom jams that stuff all the time. And my dad, like he calls out band names all the, like he was talking about ginger today. And I'm just like, we have come a long way down. (laughs) So they're doing good. (laughs) So you guys, um, you guys did the self-release, uh, EP, um, the relentless EP. And then you kind of. There kind of was there a gap in between that till about now, like 2018, when you released Freak. Was there like a time where you guys weren't? Because uh, on your Wikipedia page, at least, it says that there was no drummer. Maybe for that period mm-hmm. of time, was that like so, a uh, a break, or were you just looking for a new drummer, or were you guys still working? We had a couple things that happened. It was like we had a we had a drummer. Um, he was from Maine, and he moved down to Georgia to join. Um, and then he, like, after a couple, like, uh, after about a year, I don't even know if it was that long, but he kind of decided that he didn't want to be in the band anymore. So he wanted to move back home. And it was during that point that where we were, had decided we were going to move to LA. So it was kind of like just this period of transitional period of time where, you know, we did not have a drummer, but also we were about to move. So it was like, well, we're moving to LA. Um, I'm sure we can find one out there. Um, and luckily we had a friend that introduced us to Ruben who had just moved here from Venezuela. So that, that worked out perfectly, but it wasn't that we really stopped or took an intentional break. It was just more so us preparing for what we needed to do when we got out here. Um, but to a lot of people, it seems kind of like we just like <laughs> went on a, a brief hiatus, but it, we didn't really, you know, we were working on writing some music and stuff during that time too. That's cool. And did, when did you guys move out to LA from Atlanta? We moved here um, September 2015. Okay, so it's been it's been a little bit then. Yeah. Um, did you? Um, obviously, you wrote you wrote most of your freak album out there, but you recorded it in Florida. So did you travel all the way back here to uh, to Audio Hammer? We actually recorded. So we recorded our Relentless EP at Audio Hammer. We recorded Freak with the same with Dave Altero, same person we recorded um, this one with in Denver. So. We and a lot of people are like, why did you move to L.A. and you record everywhere but L.A.? But it's like we we did it in Denver um, with him in like. I think we started that record in January of 2016. So literally right after we moved, we went to Denver and and started Freak. Interesting. And Mm -hmm. did you just say that you had your your second LP already recorded? Um. So you mean the one coming up? Yes, correct. Your se- <laughs> yeah, your, yeah. Your, soft, oh, it's... your sophomore quote unquote album. It's completely done. Yeah, it's been done for months. Mm. <laughs> do you know? Yeah, like, we... Do you know when it might might come out? Um, we're still tossing it around. You know, before it was supposed to come out in the summer of this summer, and then you know, obviously the pandemic and all that happened. 
So we pushed it back to the fall, but now we're with Napalm and um, we're kind of adjusting now, get everything set there. And it might be pushed back a little bit more, but we have like a few singles and stuff that we're dropping soon. So, okay. And um, yeah. was that a plan or was like, was, was Napalm out of the blue or cause you said you had it, the release planned already mm-hmm. for the summer, obviously then the pandemic, blah, blah, blah. But you recently just signed a Napalm Records uh, mm-hmm. to another quote unquote very lucrative deal, as yeah. uh, we've posted about. But um, <laughs> was that like how did that happen? How did how did you guys get in touch with Napalm? Did they reach out to you? And like how did that deal work out? Um, it was through our management. You know, they they we weren't. It wasn't necessarily a plan. Um, but you know we we've, we've had several labels interested, and honestly, we just. We didn't want to rush into anything with anyone. We wanted to make sure we got the right deal. So they were able to give us what we were looking for. And, you know, we pulled the trigger on it. So <laughs> Interesting. Um, was Napalm like a label that you guys were looking forward to maybe signing to? Or were there like what were the ones that you guys wanted to be a part of? We wanted to be a part of on it. You know, we've always been a band that like we had the means to do it ourselves. So we were not sh- afraid to do it ourselves, but we were, we always said like, if we signed to a label or when we signed to a label, you know, we wanted to be one that is as excited about us as we are them. And, you know, sees our vision. We have like really big goals, you know, um, bigger than in most bands in today's day and age. And <laughs> so we have to have a team with us that kind of believes the same thing and believes that it can happen. Um, and they were. So, it, you know, it was about, you know, we wanted whoever believed in us the way that we believe in ourselves and vice versa. So, you know, they, they proved that they did. And, and that's all that, that we needed. That's cool. They Historically, they've been like a very metal um, label. But as far as like they, they do all different outlet, like different offshoots of metal, like black metal, progressive mm-hmm. metal, this, that, or the other. But they also do other it seems like recently they're starting to, you know, expand. They do like, you're more like devil driver, I guess, um, mm-hmm. with on, on napalm. Cause they're on napalm as well, but they've expanded to other kind of sub genres of metal, uh, like the dropout yeah. Kings and stuff like that. So, um, how do you feel being like one of the bands that kind of stands out a little more on their roster? Yeah, it's cool. Cause like a lot of their bands are, you know, especially being a European, you know, bass label a lot of their bands are like you know they have a lot of like power metal bands and a lot of you know stuff like that like european metal but we actually like that a lot because like you said we do kind of stick out on the label we're not like one of 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 many of the same genre um and they also don't have like a ton of american bands so it's really cool that we're one you know one of the few american bands that can cross over and everything um so I think I think that'll be cool. It'd be something that isn't just like one of many, and and that's an, that was another thing we really liked, you know. Um, whereas we could go to another label and just be kind of one of their crossover metal bands, you know. Right. Um, with Nap with Napalm, it, you know, we we stand out, so that's cool. That's cool. And uh, mm-hmm. so basically, I guess like the pandemic somewhat worked out for you guys because you know it you gave you time to like not go anywhere and do anything, but also I guess this deal kind of you know, I don't want to say f- fell in your lap, but obviously you could focus more on other things outside of playing. Yeah. And it, it's, it's funny because everyone's like, you know, they're like, Oh, it sucks. The pandemic. And it, it really, it's kind of weird to say, but it kind of played into our advantage a little bit because I say this all the time. This was going to be one of the craziest years of touring, like for this genre in a long time, we had like Deftones going out with Gojira and Megadeth mm-hmm. and you know Trivium and Lamb of God and we it was just like insane. So it was gonna have to, it was gonna be a lot of for like an up a rising band to like sift through you know as far as like touring concerned and like there was al- a lot of albums being put out this summer, but with the pandemic it kind of helped us a little because we didn't have to sift through all that traffic you know um, right. a lot of bands postponed things or pushed it back so it was kind of like you know what dude like. This is kind of this is okay for us because we don't have a t- like all this competition and people are at home and they're bored, um, so we can really push something out there and and people have the capacity to listen right now because they're not you know going to work every day or or whatever. Right. So it worked out a lot for us. We always try to 
just adapt to what's going on because you know in like the music business in general there's always going to be some kind of problem not a pandemic but there you know there's always right. going to be like or, or delays. So, yeah yeah so the most you the more you can adapt the better off you'll be so that's just what we try to do so how would you describe to someone who's obviously never heard of you or never seen you live how would you describe the current sound that they could ex- you know expect on the uh on your upcoming album, is it still titled Unstoppable? It's unstable, yeah. Unstable, uh, sorry. Yeah, no, you're good. Um, it, yeah, it is still unstable, and I would say, you know, it's, there's a lot on this record. There's a little bit of something for everyone. Um, I say it a lot, but there's stuff on this record that's, like, the heaviest stuff we've ever done. Like, literally the heaviest stuff we've ever done, and then there's also stuff that's, like, super catchy, something you might hear on Octane or whatever. Um, so it's it's a little it's a mix, but we do like we grew up on bands where it's like they could be like super heavy, but they still have like those big catchy choruses and stuff you can sing back and like people who might not be into metal can still get into them. And we always kind of write with that in mind. That's just kind of what we enjoy doing. So that's basically what this out al- this album is. That's where we are, you know. People, all, you know, there's the typical com- comparisons people give us like Slipknot and Linkin Park and Corn and all that. Um, but I would say it, it's it falls somewhere in that realm, you know. Throw a little Lamb of God in there and some solos, and you know that's us. But I, I would I always just say like mainstream metal, you know, like some people call it gateway metal, you know, which I'm all right with. So <laughs> it's your mainstream metal that you can like sing back, you know, nothing nothing too extreme. <laughs> it, yeah, that's a good description of it. Um, I would say. I'm basing it off of your your latest single that you just put out because I'm I'm assuming that's more of kind of what Unstable will be. Um, I'm the single I'm not right, correct? That is that on the album? It is, yeah. So based off of that particular song, and I've I listened to Freak a lot today as well, just to kind of get into into a mindset of like your 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 sound and stuff. But yeah. um, I would say like Josh kind of has a at times like a Chester Bennington vibe. So I get the uh, Lamb of God, uh, not Lamb of God, sorry, Lincoln Park yeah. reference. Um, and also corn, heavy corn, definitely, yeah. I think. But, you know, when when I ask people about you guys, because like I've known about you guys probably since 2000, late 2018. Yeah. Um, when when a lot of people talk about you guys, it's all, it's about the solos and the guitar mm-hmm. and the riffs. And you're a big yeah. part of that. So um, how how do you feel about, you know, writing solos over, over all this, you know, new metal type sounds, but trying to make it, you know, mainstream metal like. Yeah. No, I think it's fun. You know, it, there's so many, so many, so many, like guitar players are so abundant nowadays. And there's so many really, really good guitar players. Like their guitar players today are just insane. So it's always cool for me to be able to, solo or riff over something that you don't like hear every day because there you know while there are so many amazing amazing guitar players nowadays and like they write some crazy riffs and they're awesome sometimes it's really hard to distinguish one from another a lot now because there's so many it's like very saturated and so for me i enjoy um being able to solo being able to riff over something that you don't hear like every single day on every album by every band. <laughs> so, um, I think that's really cool, you know, and, and it, you know, it, we just with freak was the first time we really tried to incorporate kind of like some of that new metal influence in there. Um, we had never tried it before and it just worked out well. It wasn't necessarily a conscious effort. We just were started writing and that kind of came out a little bit. Um, and people liked it. So with this album, we were like, you know what, we're just going to jump in head first and do whatever we want, do what comes out natural. Um, and that's, what, that's what kind of came out natural, but it's insane. Like, you know, there's some sick riffs on this record and, and like, for instance, you know, people say like, Oh, there's not many bands that have new metal influence that solo. But like, I, I always, like I say, I compare my playing a lot to like a Jim Root or something where it's not very boxed in. So like he might have a song where it's just like one riff, the whole song and there's not much going on, but then he has another one, where him and Mick are just riffing like crazy and like there's a solo and it's super cool. And and I like that. Like I like, you know, you can't expect just one thing from me as a guitar player. Um, so that's kind of always what we try to do. We just, just write what we enjoy. And that's how this record is too guitar wise. It's like 
there are songs where there's a lot of riffs and there's a solo and it's fast. And then we have some like I'm Not Right where there's no solo. Um, it's more sounds based and all and all that kind of stuff. So I enjoy all aspects of guitar playing. Um, it's funny when people are like, oh, you know, riffs are gone or that sounds like head or something. And I'm like, <laughs> there's nine other songs on the record, guys. It'll be OK. Um, so, yeah, it's just whatever, whatever we feel. I don't like to be boxed in, but I like to have a good time and just explore the guitar as much as possible. Yeah. I mean, because in the, another interview you said um, you had on YouTube at some point or somewhere, um, you were you were speaking about when you were on Freak, you guys were experimenting a lot and how like on this upcoming record, you kind of like honed it all in. So it's it's interesting. You said that you jumped in head first on the new metal kind of vibes. But, you know, I'm glad that. Uh, a lot of people are letting go of the gatekeeping of new metal and new metal is becoming like a cool again genre. Uh, yeah. I, I was a big fan of new metal early on. So when you say like, Oh, it sounds like head PE. I'm like, yeah, but there's a lot of still diehard head PE fans out there. Yeah. No. It, and it's, it's funny because I say, I, I was, when I was talking to metal hammer, I said the same thing. It's like, you know, I think um, a lot of the people who grew up on, on like new metal, like that, that era are now like an emerging band. So like Very true. that sound is coming out a lot. Like I heard a new North Lane song yesterday because someone tweeted us, like tagged us in a tweet with them. And I listened to it and I'm like, that is a straight up new metal song. So I think a lot of it has to do with that. We're all like kind of around the same age that are coming up. And so that's what we loved. And that's what we saw at the forefront at that time. Um, and that's what we truly enjoy. Like that's, like I said, still to this day, those are the bands that I listen to. And I wasn't like, you know, I wasn't a deep diving new metal fan. Like I wasn't listening to like a lot of Cold Chamber or anything like that. <laughs> but it was, de- it was definitely Disturbed, you know, Linkin Park, Corn, that you know, System of a Down, like Ozfest those bands. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, those were the bands that just really got me into this. So, you know, I and I enjoy it. I enjoy that they were heavy. They had groove. They could play fast. They had like weird ominous sounds and like you know star power vocalists and all that like it was just there's a lot about about that time that i think also like it's a tangent but i think also helped metal too because oh, yeah. you know it it brought metal to the like people don't give it enough credit those bands brought metal to the forefront you know like it became bigger than you know a lot of bands had ever been at that time 100 percent. so trl yeah, it, trl and uh mtv and i mean you know corn people forget corn I think Life is Peachy peaked at number three on the billboard when it released, you know? Yeah. And that's insane. And that was like basically the kickoff of like new metal. But yeah, yeah. I, I don't, do you, do you follow the punk rock NBA? I do. I watched, I actually watched his, uh, I've watched a lot of his videos, but yeah, Finn. I did watch the new metal one uh, yeah. not long ago. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, that's the one I'm kind of, I'm kind of referencing right now in my head because, um, you know, he kind of nailed it on the, on the head there. It, mm-hmm. it did blow up like insanely for that like little time period. But it was yeah. also like very influential, and um, and it's interesting. You also say that you know, like people your age, or, or and again, I don't know how old you are, but um, younger people grew up listening to that. And like you said, your first you know two CDs were uh, the Nirvana Unplugged and Toxicity, and Toxicity mm-hmm. is like one of the best new metal albums of all time in general. Oh, yeah. You know, and yeah. uh, so using that as like a crux into that genre is amazing and that album is insanely heavy and also has like you know hardcore slash metalcore vibes throughout the Mm -hmm. whole thing so it's it's a great album it's still really heavy too i listen to it now and i'm like those guitar tones are still so heavy yeah yeah. every time i listen to prison song when it first kicks on i'm like god damn that is fucking it's heavier than i remember it you know what i mean oh yeah oh yeah and and also what i think is cool and a lot of people say like it might be some kind of cop out is like you know the you could if at that time you could name everybody in all those bands like you could look at system of a down you could look at you know corn or whatever and you knew every member of the band you see a poster and you're like oh that's fieldy from corn or you know and i feel like it's something that's been lost now you know it's so hard like you show me a picture of a lot of bands now and i'm like unless it's the singer or something i'm just like i have no idea who that is you know unless they're like a huge band um but during that wave it was like almost like metal bands were becoming like kind of like pop stars at the time and i think that like you know there's something to say about that like you know i people i think people don't give it enough credit sometimes for what it did for for the genre for the time it was around yeah no it it definitely got too popular too quick and turned into a pop thing which 
probably was a negative drawback for the whole genre, but yeah, amongst all that, there was some great, there was some great stuff. And like, yeah, like you said, they even had like magazine, <laughs> like <laughs> J14 styled magazines for new metal. Oh, like, I know. Like circus, yeah. <laughs> like circus uh, magazine. You could, you could yeah, get posters out of. Hit Parader or something. Yeah, all that those. Was, yeah. It reminds me of my like teenage bedroom. I used to oh. buy those magazines and have like, you know, that's when you say you knew everyone in the band, you definitely did because like you would, you know, they there's only like a handful of bands that they were actually, you were able to get a hold of in general. Like, that's true. This is early yeah. internet days too, you know. Like, right, that's true. Dial up and cable internet had just maybe started. But yeah, uh, yeah that, was, that was a great time. <laughs> oh, yeah. I agree. <laughs> so... Speaking of like your guitar work and all this that the other, um, you you gained a lot of praise in the last couple of years, and you were actually was it the first black female to be on the cover of a couple guitar magazines for I should say metal and rock. So it was the first African American female like lead guitar player to be featured in major publications. So like Guitar World, Guitar Player, Premier Guitar. Um, which I didn't even know until someone told me one day and I like hit up my publicist and I like, look, we were looking around and I was like, Holy shit. Like I, I am like, this is the first. Um, so it, it wasn't something we were trying to do or anything like that. It just naturally happened and it became a really big deal. Um, so it was a, it was a pleasant surprise. Yeah. I mean, does it make you feel like, how does it feel to be kind of like, in the grand scheme of things, you could be looked up to as like an innovator of some si- of some kind to other, you know, females in general. How does that make you feel? It's pretty cool. Like I, I am thankful to have, have that, um, and to have made that happen because like I said, when I started playing, um, people used to always mention to me as well, like, you know, you're like, you don't see a black girl playing like metal guitar. And I would be like, what are you talking about? Like, it's not like, I was like, that's dumb. Like, it's not even something that I even think about. Um, but the older I got, people started mentioning it more like, you know, um, this is unique. This is really different. And I noticed how much it made people curious about Tetrarch in general, just that element of our band. And I always thought it was weird, but as I got older, I think I embraced it a little bit more and was like, more thankful for it because it's it's not like a gimmick it's just like kind of a natural thing that happened like right. if i was a a white girl or an asian boy or something i would still be playing guitar in a band but so it's just kind of something that naturally happened um and i'm i'm glad that it's it's played to our benefit it, it, it's cool to inspire people i always used to say that when i was younger like i would love to inspire other girls to do the same thing so now that i'm actually like at that point it, it's cool to look back and and uh, everything comes full circle. Yeah. No, I mean, it's, I don't want to say rare now, but it, it definitely was more rare early on to even have like a female guitar player in a band, it's, mm-hmm. and especially in like a hardcore metal, you know, arena yeah. in America, I should say, because Europe kind of had a bunch of uh, female guitar players too coming up. In they metal. do, yeah. But um, yeah, let alone, you know, like an African-American black female in general mm-hmm. so yeah that does it it does uh it's cool that you say you never saw it as a thing or never kind of never no one ever told or no one ever told you it wasn't a thing either because yeah you know, that could be very detrimental <laughs> growing up right right yeah and, I, and i'm glad i didn't i didn't uh wasn't like super in tune to it early or anything like that because i'm it didn't hinder the way i looked at you know me being able to learn guitar or anything like that i didn't feel insecure about it or anything so i'm glad i didn't i never really thought about it that way um so i just like and and people ask me a lot they're like you know what female you know guitar players were your influences and i like i used to make stuff up like (laughs) i'd be like uh you know and then finally one day josh was just like you know you don't have to make stuff up just say you didn't really have any and i was like yeah that's true so (laughs) i started to feel like you know all my influences were like white dudes you know (laughs) slash and kirk hammond dimebag daryl and stuff like that's who i watched and that's who i imitated and um so i didn't ever i never looked at myself as as any different uh and you know until it was like you know everyone started talking about it but (laughs) yeah (laughs) no it's interesting because like that i mean granted forms of media and just kind of like how an audience or an individual 
intakes content in general has changed over the course of, you know, five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. So whereas you're right, it's, it's typically like a white male, like Slash or, or, or Dimebag Daryl or, any, or anyone like mm-hmm. that because that was like who fit the mainstream look of metal and that's who, what was kind of like pushed or whatever, blah, blah, blah. But it's, right. it, it'll be interesting to see how, you know, everything is blending so much now and everyone's playing everything and everyone's experimenting with everything, how mm-hmm. it could be five years from now, 10 years from now. and just Oh, yeah. And, and we, even even when I started, like, as a kid playing guitar, you still didn't see as many girls playing guitar as you do now. Like, yeah, exactly. now I, I see them every day and I'm like, oh, man, that's another, like, female shredder. And like you said, a lot of them are not American. Like, there's so many overseas, like, in Russia and stuff. Those girls slay guitar. Yes. I'm like, what <laughs> in the world? Um but there's definitely so many more emerging every day, which is really cool. Like, and they're good. Like, you know, they're really good players. And even, you know, I really commend uh, Reba from Code Orange too because I say it all the time. She is. She reminds me a lot of myself in the sense like, we get on stage with like t-shirts and like jeans on, and like, you know, we're not like super like girly girl or anything like that. We just get up there and just slay guitar. And I love that about her. Um, it's all about the music, and she's just super raw. Um, and like I said, even 10 years ago, like there wasn't really anyone like that in a, a band in the forefront, you know, oh, no, doing yeah, that. Exactly, so, yeah. yeah. So it's really cool. Yeah. It's definitely, um, I don't want to say like a new wave thing, but you know, a lot more people have been exposed to a lot more things than culturally they would be 10 years ago, 20 years ago. So, you know, it's becoming right. more of a norm. Right. Exactly. Um, so you guys all, did you guys all move out to LA and like, live in like a gamer house like did you all like get a house together and you're all like roommates we so we got an apartment in north hollywood um and two of us were in one room and two are in the other um it's not like that it's not like that anymore now me and josh just live together uh in a two-bedroom but um yeah we lived together for a while and then actually our drummer never um lived with us though it was a friend of ours but uh he lived you know, in Hollywood. And then Ryan moved out our bass player. He finally moved to Burbank. He got his own place. So, but we did for the first year, uh, the three of three of us out of four were here and it, you know, it, it definitely, that helped a lot cause things were a lot cheaper. Um, <laughs> and you know, we could support each other. You know, it, it, a lot of people move out to LA by themselves, no kind of connection here whatsoever. Um, I grew up coming here a lot with my parents. My parents used to live out here f- before I was born for like 10 years or so. So like I, I visited here all the time. So I was very familiar with LA, but it was nice moving here with the band, you know, mm-hmm. because I didn't feel alone in it or, or anything like that. Um, so did you guys like, do you guys do some music full time or is there like, do you guys stream on Twitch as gamers or do you guys have like day jobs and everything like that? We don't, we just literally do Tetrarch. That's it. Oh, nice. Yeah. It's uh. It's definitely really, it's definitely nice. Um, I knock on wood, <laughs> but it's super nice. And like, we don't, we don't have to go to nine to five or anything like that. So, but it's nice because we've literally focused all day on, on this and it helps us a lot because I know how hard it would be to have to juggle both. We did work in restaurants like way be- when we first moved here, um, but we don't anymore. Would it be because you have, uh, signed your new deal or was that something that you guys have just been kicking back and doing for a couple we stopped working a while a while ago um but you know it's always helpful and and nice that we do have you know a like a a label in our corner now so we're not doing everything um on our own but we we were able to stop working before that interesting um so you say you were mentioning team earlier do you guys have like a team around you as well like that run certain things for you. Like you mentioned, you had a publicist and Mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So like, uh, it seems to be like younger bands that are more uh, on the come up seem Mm -hmm. to have other people outside of their core group that helped them along the way. Do you think that's becoming more of a norm too? I mean, you know, things are a little more accessible now than they were, you know, 10, 15 years ago, I think. Um, but we definitely, we have a team, we have, you know, publicist manager, um, a radio team, you know, promo team. So we had, we had a, we definitely had a full on team around us and we still do, um, even with the label. So 
it definitely you kind of have to in a sense to get certain certain things done you know we did a lot on our own for a lot of years and then just adding that team just you know it's just added steroids to the whole equation it was super helpful so it's definitely a net I, I think it's definitely necessary for for a band you, um you don't necessarily need it until a certain level i don't think but then when you get to that point you kind of you kind of have to when you're dealing with like you know radio and and press and all that kind of stuff it's a lot easier to have have a team behind you yeah have someone else handle it for you yeah thank you <laughs> um so you guys before you guys moved out there were you guys touring a lot or was it more like just weekend or shows and this kind of thing uh because when i we posted about a couple of your shows i think and mm -hmm. you did a, a tour with um devil driver and 36 crazy fist a couple years mm -hmm. ago um yeah. Was that kind of like your intro into like a long stint on the road? We had, we had, we've been touring a good bit since 2013. So we have done, um, usually we had been touring a lot before that. Um, but obviously it was like DIY type mm -hmm, stuff. Mm -hmm. And we would go out for like, you know, three, four weeks, um, at a time. Um, and it was like we would a lot of times we would do like one or two of those a year and then a lot of like week longers or two week long and stuff like that. But we'd have a couple like, you know, six weeks or, or whatever out on the road. Um, Devil Driver was the first tour with like a national tour like that. Like we had we had played all those places. Excuse me. We had played a lot of those places for the most part, but that was the first on an actual package. Like I a think. smaller like a smaller D like a smaller bill. Yeah, 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 I think it was the first, like, with, like, because that was Devil Diver 36 Crazy Fist and Kane Hill. Yeah, so it was the first, like, that. Um, but it definitely wasn't the first tour. Interesting. Was yeah. Epicenter your first kind of taste at festival playing? It was, yeah, that was our first uh, major festival. And that was last year's. Was that your uh, Was that your only DWP festival, or did you play other ones? That was the only DWP fest. We played that one, and then we played uh, X and One Eleven, which isn't DWP, but we played that in October. The, that was the one in Tennessee at the Bonnaroo. Yes, farm. exactly. Yeah, interesting. Mm -hmm. How was that one? It was really cool because um, they're not it doing it the, anymore. So I, you know, right? It was the same exact weekend as Aftershock. So even though they're on the separate parts of the country, mm -hmm. I still think it was weird to have it in that same weekend. Cause you know, people fly out to, to a lot of those festivals. So a lot of people flew to aftershock and I knew so many people in and in the industry and not in the industry that wanted to go to exit 11, but they couldn't cause they had to go to aftershock. So mm -hmm. I think that might've affected it a little bit, but it was still really fun. And that, that bill was pretty awesome. Like it was so mixed, you know, you had GNR and Lamb of God and go Jira and Deftones. It was like a really, really good bill. Right. Um, it was freezing cold. Like it was like a really, really cold time of, of the year. It was like, 20 degrees outside or something <laughs> and it was just like so there was a couple things about it but it was it was a really cool fest um the guy who put it on we have known for a long time he used to book at our hometown venue in, in atlanta at the masquerade um he's now he now works for clear uh, for clear channel so um he did that did that festival and it was super cool like i love it i would play it again in a heartbeat the fans were so nice it had a blast um only downside for me was it was freaking cold. Yeah. <laughs> I think well, I caught the flu that weekend. Oh, that sucks. I definitely have been to that same location in the summertime during Bonnaroo, and it is um, sometimes can be brutally hot. <laughs> oh, yeah. I can in the south. You know, it, it has the both sides of the spectrum. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that brings me to my next question, because it seemed like you guys were kind of gearing up to do a lot more of that kind of stuff, too. Um how bummed were you that things have gotten kind of pushed back with this whole pandemic? And like, how has that affected your, like your, your tour plans? Are you rescheduling a lot of the stuff or are you just, is everything different now with Napalm? Um, a lot of it is just moved back. Cause f like we weren't, we didn't have like dates announced or like tours announced. So that helped us a little bit. It was all just in motion. So we're able to just kind of easily move it to next year versus like, having to cancel or having all these tickets sold already. Um, so a lot of it's just being moved. I know like a lot of the festivals like that were booked for this year have basically the, the same ones just moved to next year. Right. So, so a lot of stuff is just moved 
to next year, which is fine because that gave us a lot of time. Like I said, this pandemic kind of played to our advantage a little bit, and we didn't know it would, but it, it just kind of <laughs> did. So um, it's okay now, but live is what we love to do. We love playing shows, so we're trying to get back out as soon as we can. Um, I don't know if it's going to be America or Europe first, which is um, which will be interesting to see, but um, all of it's just moved back. Nothing has been, like, you know, detrimentally, you know, messed up or anything. Would that be your first time playing across across yeah. the pond? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so yeah. That's a perk, I guess, of having a European record label too, huh? I mean, yeah, and, I, you know, I know there won't be any shortage of, of shows and festivals over there now because they're, they're in Austria, so there's – uh, you know, their bands are constantly on festivals and all that kind of stuff. So we're excited about it. We've always wanted to go overseas and we were planning on going anyways, but now I'm, I'm even more excited about, about going over there. Yeah. You can definitely get your foot right on the foot in the door for a lot of those really cool metal festivals that they ha- have over in oh. Europe, across the, across Europe. Oh yeah, for sure. I'd like to go to download. That's on the list. That's on the bucket list. Me too. That's <laughs> like, you know, like that. I had a download fest DVD as a kid. And like that was just the fest, you know, that I wanted all, I've always wanted to play. So I'm really excited to finally hopefully get on that and be playing download. That seems, that seems like it has the biggest uh, mix as far as mm-hmm. like, I guess for someone like me, an American, I guess it has mm-hmm. the biggest mix of bands that I would, I could enjoy because it has all kinds of, heavy genres you know no matter yeah. what you're into it's like new metal metal black metal they even do metalcore hardcore sometimes mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah that'd be a great one and it, and it's cool because all the stages are always packed like no matter if you're main stage or like side stage or in the tent stage or whatever it's like there's thousands of people there just ready to have a good time and and their mindset over there is a little different from over here whereas they're super open to whatever band it is like they want to have a good time and enjoy it and you know, it's not about like, you know, how well they know the band or anything. If the band gets up there and they're having a good time, it looks like they're open to to everything. So that that's what's really cool, and and that's what you hear a lot from bands about going over there is how different the fans are. So I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. Do you, do you think that that plays into like how your band is received over here in America? Like because you have kind of like a quote unquote new metal sound. Hmm. Um, you know, it's, it's funny. We actually went, like, we went over so many fans live because people always see us live and they're like, oh, you're heavier than I thought you were. And we're just like, oh, Jesus. So like, you know, we gained so many fans when we're on tour and we're on the road because, you know, we have songs that are, you know, new metal influence, but we have a lot that are just fucking heavy and they come off really good live and really energetic. We put out a lot of energy at shows. So we've never seen any kind of negative backlash or anything from our live shows. It's always positive. So that's why we always can't wait to get, get out there. And we don't even like, we don't even call ourselves a, like a new metal band ever. We're just like, yeah, we're a metal band, you know, it definitely such says a ne- American metal band on your Wikipedia. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it's like, you know, some people, there's like a, when people think new metal, a lot of times they think like Limp Bizkit, like instantly that comes to mind and they're like, ah, oh, rap metal, you know? And that yeah. is like, we're the furthest thing from Limp Bizkit at, at possible. So, we just say we fall under the metal umbrella. There, there we have different influences in there. So, no, you you seeing mainstream metal is definitely, I think, hitting it on the head. I mean, yeah, there's definitely people that will probably have a dislike for the term mainstream metal, but yeah. also there's people, you know, you would be a great band for someone who listens to like progressive rock radio, whatever mm-hmm. that may be. Yeah, you may be a great band to transition someone into some like extreme form of metal too. Because yeah. you have kind of different, in, you know, like you all play different styles of music and whatnot all together. Like you, you solo and, sh- and do other yeah. things on top of riffs and stuff like that, too. So it, it's it's cool that you can be that kind of band, too. Yeah, and then we, we kind of had to learn that we're not going to please everybody. <laughs> so, you know. Um, what? Yeah, I know. Something that we bands have to learn, which seems really silly, but you know, you want to be, you want everybody to like you, but at some point you're just like, I will literally go crazy if I (laughs) try to do that. So, you know, we just like our fan demographic are usually, it's very wide age, age wise, but they're usually more open metal fans that you'll see them with a slipknot shirt on. Next day you'll see them with an Opeth shirt on. Like they're very like, and that's how I was, Mm -hmm. you know, I didn't, 
I wasn't like hardcore or die, you know, I was just like, <laughs> it's, you know, I liked everything. Like I can listen to the ghost inside. I can listen to Paramore. Like I can listen to whatever. I'm just a music fan. So a lot of our fans are the same. Like they'll be like, you know, their favorite band might be bullet from a Valentine or, or something like that. And they love our band. Um, but w- uh, we, the elitist are not, our biggest fans but that's honestly fine with us <laughs> so yeah i mean it's going to be a lot of uh like i said earlier it, i think the gatekeeping for that kind of stuff has started to fade away especially because like like you said younger people in general just come up listening to whatever and not having anyone chastise them so 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 to speak but like i grew up in the time where that was the, was the was the yeah. situation so like when i was listening to paramore i had to do it in private and so you know, it was i couldn't admit out out that i'd like oh yeah you know i listened to paramore or or uh yeah. taking back sunday or anything it was always like nah bro i'm just like hardcore or die yeah so, no yeah. hardcore only man <laughs> it was a good time so, though, you know <laughs> it, it was really funny though because i remember the we like coming up like we would play shows Pretty much most fan bases really got into the show. Like, we just put on a pretty, uh, you know, not to your own horn, but we put on a good live show. We've been playing live so long that, you know, usually people have a blast at our shows. But the one crowd that just never got into us was, like, that, that super hardcore fan base. Like, I remember we played this festival on tour one time in San Antonio, Texas. And it was we got thrown on a bill. It was like a hardcore festival at this. It was like, what was that venue called? The white Swan or no, I forgot what it was called. But anyways, we got thrown on this festival and it was like a two stage, like a two room festival. And there was probably like 600 kids there. Mm -hmm. And so like they would stagger the stages. Everybody was in the other room. We're setting up, getting ready. And we're like, man, there's so many kids here. It's going to be sick. And literally when we started playing, they all went outside. Like, I think there was like three people in the room. And I'm telling you, there was like six to 700 people at this thing. And we were just like, I don't think hardcore fans really care about our band too much. So that was, you know, that's one that, you know, they weren't like fans of ours. But they re- they respected our band. They always respected us. But as far as just being like fan fans, eh, you know. <laughs> yeah. It's hard to win those, that crowd over sometimes. Yeah. And they have their bands they know and they love those bands. And that's what they go see. And they're not trying to divert from that. So um, with the with the new metal resurgence and stuff like that, what would be like some prime tour packages that you would you and the band would like to play with and are you planning on doing any of that yeah nothing planned really um you know but i mean it's it's funny because the bands that we would like to you know obviously we're one of those bands we're like we want a headline like (laughs) so that's always the goal we're always shooting for that but um i would say you know like it, it doesn't it's no surprise but like i would love to tour with you know disturbed i'd love to tour with slipknot of course i'd love to tour with corn um i'd love to tour with you know can't tour lincoln park but that'd be super awesome just it just your the ones that you would just be able to naturally pick and most people would say like sismo down would be completely Mm -hmm. awesome um bands like that like i said i was never into like super got into like any of like the underground like people compare us a lot to edema and me and josh are like (laughs) we know one edema song and it was after everyone started comparing us to edema like we had never listened to him before so um you know it would probably just be your typical bands like my first metal show was metallica lincoln park deftones mudvayne limb biscuit it was summer sanitarium 2003 oh, and nice. so yeah and so like that build to this day is still like i'm like oh you just wouldn't see that anymore it of was course sick. not yeah yeah um but something like that would be amazing. But it was a, it was obviously a stadium tour. It was at the baseball stadium and stuff like that. But it's really cool. I wish we could see stuff like that again, you know. But. Who knows? I think with the – well, maybe with the lack of shows and touring in general, maybe they can go for broke and have a lot of these big-name bands do yeah. big, big stadium tours like that. That's true. Maybe people will be so excited to get back and, and get to a show that they'll be – buying tickets and stuff it'd be it'd be great we're we're hoping for the best like i said we have some pretty wicked touring plans coming up uh for next year we were talking about them today with our team and um not with new metal bands but there's <laughs> some, some really good bands so we're, we're looking forward to it hopefully hopefully the crowds are ready you know yeah how does that affect like your your guys's planning are you worried that there'll be too many shows once everything starts back up or are you guys just gonna be like screw it we're gonna throw ourselves in the mix it's definitely something to think about, but 
at this point, we're not worried about uh, the competition of it. Um, because I, you know, like I said, I think people will be really also more appreciative of shows. I think for a little while, at least they'll be like, oh man, we see what it was like with a year of no shows. Like that sucked. Um, we're going to go out and have a good time and go to as many shows as we can. So hopefully a lot of people look at it like that, but we're not, we're not worried about it. Like I said, the package that we're working on now, um, that we were talking about today, there's nothing to be afraid of with it. So, (laughs) um, we're excited. We're more excited than nervous about it. Cool. Well, um, that kind of wraps it up for us. Is there anything else that you would like to, you know, plug, whether it be your new album coming out or, you know, something that you promote or that you're into or whatever or something that we should check out? Yeah, just for everyone to keep an eye on on everything we're doing, like on our socials and everything. I mean, things pop up, it seems like, every other day now. Um, It's a good problem to have, but, you know, I just appreciate everybody's support and just – keep checking back our album will be out we'll have some new singles out in the next month or two and and yeah just uh keep riding that wave <laughs> cool deal. and then yeah the your socials are going to be in the description but if you want to go ahead and tell them what they are yeah. so they can follow you too yeah yeah um so uh facebook is tetrarch music uh instagram's tetrarch music youtube's tetrarch live um twitter is just tetrarch so pretty much anywhere you type in tetrarch will will probably pop up there's not <laughs> Many things with that name, except for like a gaming company that's like Tetra, I don't know, Tetrarchy or something. But you'll you'll know the difference. The, so. Call, of, the Call of Duty game maker. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And that is uh, uh, you spell it T E T R A R C H, correct? Exactly. Cool. And if you're watching it on YouTube, is your flag that you have in the back? <laughs> there you go. Well, cool, Diamond. <laughs> Thank you very much for taking your time on this Monday with us, and um, good luck in the future. And hopefully, we hear from you again. Yeah, thanks for having me, bud. I appreciate it. All right.